Thank you for uh, coming to uh, this year's 2012 uh, Chamberlain uh, Lecture. Uh, our friend and colleague, Barbara Back, who passed away on August 23rd, was the initial organizer of this event, and I'd like to just have a moment of silence uh, in her memory. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge the extraordinary ethic, uh, efforts and ethics of our program coordinator, Kim McDonough. Where are you, Kim? Kim, would you stand up? She has done such a wonderful job coordinating this event. And we have uh, important guests uh, with us. Dean Schmidtman uh, from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is here. Dick Doak, uh, 42 years at the Register, and our Schwartz Award winner. And uh, Terry Rich, the head of the Iowa Lottery, and our council member. Our speaker tonight, Barbara Iverson, just happens to be this year's Schwartz Award winner, in addition to being our Chamberlain lecturer, so we're going to honor her later with that award. But that's the, uh, the highest honor that Iowa State University gives for contributions in journalism and mass uh, communication, and I wanted to acknowledge that you are also a double winner of being chosen as our Chamberlain lecturer and being a Schwartz Award winner. The Chamberlain Lecture is one of the Greenlee School's uh, three signature events, along with our Futures Forum and our nationally uh, renowned First Amendment Day. All are sponsored by friends and alumni of the Greenlee School. The, the Chamberlain Lecture, though, is, is important in, in many ways unique because it brings together so many people and organizations all passionate about their investment and the next generation of journalists. That's you. I know you're getting some extra credit for coming, but the real credit is when you get a job and start earning your way. We are uh, very grateful to our benefactor, Iowa State alumna and friend, Margie uh, Chamberlain, who is right here with her son, Steve. Margie, would you just raise your hand so that they can see you? Margie and her late, uh, her late husband and my friend, Jean Chamberlain, um, have done so much uh, for schools of journalism and for uh, journalism education, not only through this event, but I, I, uh, I knew Margie and Jean when I, was, uh, when I had hair and I was in my 20s <laughs> at my alma mater, South Dakota State University, and they were publishers of the Mobridge Tribune and supporters of the journalism school at Brookings, my alma mater. Um, their uh, former newspaper is still flourishing today because of their legacy of education and innovation, and they continue to win general excellence awards by the South Dakota Newspaper Association. And of course, my days go back to dear Bill McDermott uh, there. Margie and Jean wanted to foster education not only at Brookings, but at their alma mater, Iowa State, by, by bringing to campus a nationally known speaker who not only would be known for her work, but who would also work with our students. And um, we got involved uh, with this education motif and the Iowa Newspaper Foundation. Jennifer, where are you? Jennifer Ace, as the director of the Iowa Newspaper Foundation, became a, a sponsor uh, of this event, along with the best darn student newspaper in the country. Right, Mark Witherspoon? Well, the Iowa Daily and their editors are right up front where they, where they ought to be. Uh, but both the Chamberlain Lecturer, which is uh, Zach uh, Kucharski, he's right here from the Cedar Rapids uh, Gazette, um, a wonderful innovator uh, helping us with digital technologies while still maintaining um, newsworthy and informative content. I appreciate what you do in that regard. Well, we all get together. This event brings everyone together. And um, Barbara Iverson and Zach Kucharski uh, will be working with the students uh, throughout this week. And um, you know, my ethics students and your portfolios, uh, we want you to get jobs. We want you to network. So if you have a chance, 
to meet with Zach or with Barbara for advice or, or counseling. I hope you do that. Another co-sponsor is the Society of Professional Journalists, um, University Lecturers. We all come together for our students, not to mention the dedicated faculty and staff of the Greenlee School, and they are peppered throughout uh, the seating here. We thank you for coming and for showing support uh, for our school. Your presence means a lot. It's my pleasure now to welcome to the podium uh, Jennifer Asa, director of the Iowa Newspaper Foundation, who will share a few words. Jennifer. I'm a little taller. <laughs> the Iowa Newspaper Foundation is pleased to again be part of this very special evening. I would like to take this opportunity to extend a very special thank you to the Chamberlain family for making this unique educational opportunity possible. Your commitment to journalism and the Greenlee School is remarkable. Now I have the opportunity to introduce this year's Iowa Newspaper Foundation Chamberlain Fellow. Zach Kacharski is a Senior Manager of Newsroom Operations for Source Media Group in Cedar Rapids. Kacharski joined the Gazette as a reporter in 2000. He has covered education, public safety, and government. He earned a degree in English from the University of Iowa, where he worked as a reporter and metro editor for the Daily Iowan. Please give a warm Iowa State welcome <laughs> to Zach Kacharski. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to take a quick second to say it's been an honor uh, to be on campus today. Uh, it, it's really a recharge when you get to come back and see uh, people who are just embarking on their careers and the wonderful questions and the wonderful things that, that you add. I get to take a lot of things back. You know, each day uh, when we're in the newsroom, we're just going about our jobs. It feels like you know, we're, we're doing things uh, that, that don't feel especially, you know, remarkable. And so to have an opportunity to come and talk about things, uh, it's a recharge for us uh, to, to, to figure out that eh, we are doing some interesting things. And there is a future in journalism, and it's good to talk about it. And so thank you uh, to everybody for that opportunity today. I also wanted to call out the hashtag for this event. Uh, it's GSCL. Uh, in the front and center there, and so uh, please uh, offer commentary uh, and your thoughts there as well. Uh, we'll be following along. Uh, I have the honor to introduce Barb Iverson, uh, tonight's speaker, and Barb is the president of Weber Shanwick's Financial Service Industry Practice Group. She works with the company offices around the world uh, to provide the seamless service to a, a variety of very well-known financial clients. The clients include MasterCard Worldwide, US, the U.S. Treasury, Prudential Retirement, Ernst & Young, and U.S. Bank, among many, many other global players. Uh, Iverson joined Weber Shanwick in 1996, and her work has involved uh, the strategic and integrated communications planning, reputation and brand management, as well as uh, a particular emphasis in the banking, electronic payments, retirement service, and insurance industries. Barb is the architect of the U.S. Treasury's Go Direct campaign, uh, and that's something that uh, is fairly remarkable and has garnered attention uh, across the country. I know our, our publication has, has noted that. Go Direct is, is a, a national initiative that's designed to get Americans to go to direct deposit rather than getting paper Social Security checks. And so uh, she's the architect behind that campaign. Before joining Weber Shanwick, Barb directed communications division at the Minnesota Department of Revenue, um, as well as the communication uh, division and management positions at the University of Wisconsin and Montana State University. Uh, Barb holds the bachelor's degree uh, from this very uh, university, and she is being honored uh, as the Schwartz, the 2012 Schwartz Award for Distinguished Service to Journalism and Communication. Uh, presented by the Greenlee School. 
Please join me uh, in jo uh, welcoming Barb Iverson. Thank you, Zach. Um, I appreciate your kind introduction, and thank you to the Chamberlains. I had a delightful dinner tonight with a group of people, and, and Margie, and, and her late husband, Jean, and her children, Steve and Kathy. So thank you so much for your generosity and your support of Iowa State and of the Greenlee School of Journalism. I can tell you it's great being here at Iowa State this evening. Uh, what a glorious day. I mean, a perfect day to be on campus. But I would say just about every day is perfect at Iowa State, having been here back in the early 70s. Love this place. Uh, besides being a big fan of Iowa State, I'm also a huge advocate for the Greenlee School of Journalism. And in fact, I credit a lot of my career success to the training that I received right here on this campus and in Hamilton Hall. I had a blast working for the Daily. I worked there for, I think, about a year and a half when I was in school, and uh, I learned so much during that time. And I know that things have changed since then, but the Iowa State Daily is still going strong. I worked there in the spring of 1974, um, and we, the editorial staff, made a big decision that early March. Um, you've heard of the word streaking, and <laughs> Streaking was a brand new phenomenon on campuses at that time. It was happening on the East Coast and the West Coast, not so much in the Midwest. And um, to this day, I'm sure some Iowans may, have re may remember what that editorial staff decided to do. I can't take the full credit for, me, for it, believe me. But we made a decision to run a photo, um, the top half of the Iowa State Daily, four columns wide, I even have proof, and it was of a streaker, front on, on the top half fold of the Iowa State Daily. Needless to say, it caused a big stir in Iowa, a huge, it was like a big uproar that the Iowa State Daily, run by a bunch of students, made a decision, news judgment, that that was news. To this day, I still think it was news. But you can imagine it, it caused quite a flurry on campus. But that was a, a great time to be here at Iowa State. And I understand that actually that caused a, tr a tradition now where streakers run between Curtis Hall and Beardshire Hall every spring or whatever. So I guess I can say that we helped advance that. Um, so anyway, um, when we ran that photo, we really felt the heat of what it was like to publish something. Uh, there was a lot of controversy over it, and you know we got hauled in to explain it and to defend it. And basically, as I recall, the journalism faculty supported us because they knew that this was the way we learn. And we made that decision, and the journalism faculty uh, really, I think, supported it. So anyway, that was kind of the beginning of my journalism career. I can't say necessarily that it was the proudest moment of my journalism career. Uh, but, but still one that, that I would probably do it again today if I were uh, in those same shoes. So anyway, um, the other another favorite memory that I had was taking a six credit editing class. I don't know if it's still offered, but Bill Kuhnerth was the faculty member and he was a wonderful professor and somebody that I really looked up to and I spent lots of time in, time in his office. and. Uh, he had this class, and we would meet from 1 to 5, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's a long time for a class. And we were learning how to you know, crop photos and to write headlines and to mock up pages and really fun stuff. And then afterwards, we would go over to Dugan's Deli and um, basically kind of continue the learning, let's just say. And Dugan's Deli was a bar over on the west side of campus at the time. And you know, of course, back then, the drinking age was 18, I think. And so anyway, it was, it was a really fun time. And we, that's really, though, a lot of the learning did continue, where we really got to know the professors and, and, and understood um, kind of what made them tick as well. So anyway, those are good memories of Iowa State. Um, I'm sorry I was not able to be here on September 7th uh, at the memorial service for, for Barbara Mack. 
I would have um, really liked to have been here, but I did watch various videos of it, and I know that a lot of you knew her and loved her. The speaker's comments were really spot on. Um, I didn't know her nearly as well as many of you did, of course, but um, talking about her amaz amazing teaching abilities, and then there was so much more, though. It was really about the rich, um, the person she was, and the kind of person she was, and how she was there for more than just teaching. And um, I can tell you that um, she's also had a positive influence on me. Um, I didn't know her as long. I've only known her for about the last three years. But she had this influence on me probably without even knowing it. Um, she came to Iowa State after I graduated in 1976, so our paths never really crossed at Greenlee. But my firm has hired interns and graduates from Iowa State's Greenlee program for a long, long time. And I can tell you, for years, students would come and rave about the training that they received. And I often heard about Barbara, as you can imagine. Uh, they raved about her as well. I met her for the first time about three years ago. I was um, Iowa State's um, program, the Society of Alumni and Friends, which you should join if you're an alum and aren't already a member. Um, they held an event in Minneapolis, and Barbara and some of the other faculty were there. And in that brief encounter, I could understand why people loved her so much. Um, she was bigger than life in a lot of ways. She was you know, bold and brilliant and maybe a little brash and funny and passionate and encouraging and compassionate, articulate, um, authentic, really authentic. And I was immediately drawn to her. So lucky for me, over the course of the next three years or so, I got to know her some, and she inspired me as well. I have to tell you a quick story about Barbara tonight, because I know that she is its near and dear to her, the Chamberlain Lecture. And I know that she's talked with Margie and, and others over the years. Um, she loved the Chamberlain Lecture and, and the Chamberlain Fellow uh, program. Uh, but last May, Michael, um, Bougea called me and notified me that the Greenlee faculty had selected me for this night's um, lecture. And I have to say I was thrilled. I told Margie this at, at dinner tonight. I truly was thrilled, but I was also a little terrified. And the reason why is because I counsel corporate leaders on a regular basis in my work, but I almost never stand before a podium, and I never talk to 300 people. So when Michael called me and told me I'd been selected for this. I thanked him, and I quickly said, I want to give that a little bit of thought. Let me get back to you. Well, that was a mistake. Um, the next thing I knew, I got an unsolicited email <laughs> from Barbara Mack bullet pointing the three reasons why the Greenlee faculty members had nominated me, and she quickly and completely kicked my butt. I mean, I'm telling you. She essentially said, how dare you say you're thinking about giving this lecture? You're thinking about this? Her key message was, don't think twice. Of course you're going to do this. So she went on to say that uh, something that really hit me, um, and because I believe it, she said, one of the most dangerous things to the success of young women is their lack of willingness to take center stage and call attention to themselves. And she didn't have to remind me, but she did, that young women don't negotiate salaries as well as men do. And it's also a well-known fact that young men don't seek, uh, that, that um, it's a well-known fact that young women don't seek promotions at the same rate that young men do. And as she pointed out, that young women tend to hide their light under this bushel of quiet efficiency, is what she called it. We're efficient, but we do it in a quiet way. And of course, you know Barbara, she was like, no way. So she said, but as a result, women have higher rates of poverty and make less over the course of their lifetime. So she closed the email by saying, Barb, you have an important story to tell. Your job is to inspire both young men and young women to be the high-performing, focused, ethical public relations practitioners of the future. Please give the Chamberlain Lecture. As many of you know, who know Barbara would agree, that was not a request. <laughs> so here I am. And thank you to the faculty for selecting me and to the Chamberlains for, um, for um, this, this great honor as well. I thank all of you who came this evening. I know some of you are here because you're required to be here. Your faculty have said, be there, or I'm going to put this on the test. Uh, I know others of you are in the middle of midterms, and it's a busy time. Some of you are here because you want to be here, and um, happy that you're all here. Um, 
some of you are also already out of college and working, working journalists, working PR people, working ad people. Some of you are business majors. Um, so I hope that in the next 30 minutes or so that it's worthwhile for you. And if I can hope for one thing, it's that you'll think about your own career goals. Um, whether you're a journalism major or an ad major or a business major or you have a passion for going into public relations like I've been in for a long, long time. So if you leave this session tonight thinking a little bit deeper about what you want to do in life and how to maintain that habit of learning new things, I believe your time will be well spent. When I was here in journalism school, America was obsessed, consumed with Watergate. It was a prime time to be in journalism. The entire country was riding this wave of investigative journalism. Watergate caused a lot of people to want to be the next uh, Bob Woodward or Carl Bernstein, and I was among them. I loved journalism. So when I got out of Iowa State, I was convinced that I was going to be a star reporter for the Des Moines Register. That is really what I wanted to do, uh, but it didn't quite work that way. Um, jobs were tough to find back then as well, and I applied to hundreds of places and got reject letter after reject letter. And finally, about 10 days before I was set to graduate in May of 76, I got two offers on the same day. One was a general assignment reporter in Clear Lake, Iowa for the Clear Lake newspaper. Um, the other was the editor of a weekly newspaper called the Lost Nation Press in Lost Nation, Iowa, in Clinton County, circulation 500. The pay was the same, $150 a week which back then wasn't very much money either. <laughs> it didn't take me five minutes, though, to decide which job I wanted. I went for the Lost Nation Press. For those who know me, and I've got three of my college roommates and college friends as well here tonight, I think for those who know me, they know that I like to be in charge. So being the editor, I knew it would give me that chance to be in charge, but it would also give me the chance to really try to make a difference. And it was a phenomenal experience. I couldn't have asked for a better first job out of college. It was far from being the star reporter for the Des Moines Register. It was so far from that. But it was an amazing, amazing job. I was editor-in-chief. I was the star reporter. I was an ad salesperson. I sold subscriptions. I was the high school student newspaper advisor. I was a janitor at night and a community leader all in one. So the fact that the Chamberlains started this with newspaper journalism, newspaper journalism is in my heart, as you can see. And to this day, I credit my experience in Lost Nation, Iowa, a town of about five or 600 people with a lot of my early success. I can tell you I still use that journalism training that I received here at Iowa State every single day. It makes you a critical thinker. It makes you resourceful. It makes you be accurate and honest. It encourages you to be curious and well-informed. And it's about strong writing. We will never forget the importance of strong writing. Strong writing is key. All of these things are important in everything that we all do. So even if you don't end up working, remaining as a working journalist forever, I certainly didn't, it's excellent cra uh, training for many careers, and it leads to a very rewarding life of intellectual curiosity. It's the, that ability to discern and to think critically that's at the heart of journalism. And it's the training that has helped me and many others, I might add, deal with the changes of the scale that we're all enduring now. When I think about journalism 36 years ago, which was when I graduated, and journalism today, and then when I think about all the changes that have happened in business and government and politics and education and, yes, journalism, and in the way people receive information, it's nothing short of transformational. Indeed, journalism as a profession has been shrinking in recent years, in large part because of technology. It's allowed consumers to communicate in ways that they never thought before possible. And because now everyone is, or at least they think they are, a publisher, a journalist, a producer, a photographer, a videographer, you name it. Interactive communications has become the norm. People now expect two-way communications, and content is king. People want content at their fingertips, and they want it from wherever they are, whenever they want it. And people are selective. They're also looking for information 24-7. 
and yes, they're still looking for it in print, even though uh, some people worry about the future of print journalism. There are more magazines now than ever, many of them very sp highly specialized, but nonetheless, more magazines than ever. And also, people are looking for everything online and on websites and through news feeds on their mobile devices, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Because people have come to expect information anytime they want it, anytime they want it, and from whether, wherever they are, they also expect that same kind of relationship with the organi organizations that they're dealing with. So that's news organizations, it's government agencies, it's the companies that they're talking with and buying products from. None of this was possible 15 years ago, or 10, or even five. So it's fair to say that every organization on the planet is trying to figure out how to feed this fire hose from which people are drinking, and also how to stand apart from it and in the midst of it. People do want content. They want content, lots of content. But they also want and need context. That's where all of you come in. Again, whether you're communicating for a news organization or working for a PR firm like I do or for a corporation, the voices of the choir are being heard on all sides now. Newsrooms, indeed, have endured some really tough years. But it's not the end of the world. And in fact, many of us consider it a huge opportunity. I prefer to think of journalism as an evolving profession and one that will offer many careers, wonderful careers in the future. I'm here to predict that quality journalism programs like Iowa State's Greenlee program and careers in public relation are both big growth areas for the future. Why, you ask, when all, there's, all this talk about journalism? It's because I would say great writing, strong communications, good storytelling, and rich content are key to pretty much everything. At long last, organizations are recognizing this as well. They know now that they have to be good communicators, good storytellers. They can't just send information out and expect that it's going to be received and listened to and acted upon. I can tell you, though, one thing, and that is, is that being a PR counselor, as I am, is much different now and much, much more complex, I might add, a com more complex proposition than it ever was when I was starting out. But the opportunities for career advancement are really endless. People talk about the wisdom of crowds. You've all heard of that, probably. Look at Greenlee. I think that today's students um, know what I'm talking about. Reports of journalism's demise have been greatly exaggerated, to paraphrase another great journalist, Mark Twain. After all, Greenlee has one of the largest enrollments ever this fall, 635 of you um, who are undergraduates and also one of the largest incoming classes of journalism and advertising pre-majors in its history. Who would think? This is further evidence that you know what I'm talking about. Now is a great time to be studying journalism, advertising, and PR. We're in a growing field, yes, changing field, but a growing field and not a declining profession. So while it may be a bit disheartening to some of you here tonight, I would say this. The truth is that news, traditional journalism, PR, and advertising are blending and blurring. And PR is a growing profession and an evolving industry with lots of avenues and opportunities for young, ambitious, smart, and well-trained communicators. So what's the big change? I would say that social media, this entire digital environment that we're all living in, is the big game changer. It's a game changer for your careers, for our profession, for the communications industry, regardless of what your job is. So nothing in decades has had the impact on journalism and PR and advertising that social media has had. It's like Watergate on steroids. Some of you have gotten, may get tired of hearing about all this social media talk, and you may believe it's too much hype, too much attention, when our focus should really be on the First Amendment and truth and ethics. Meanwhile, others of you have grown up with it, and you probably don't even know what the big deal is. This is life, right? It's a natural part of your world. But I would argue this, that social media and the digital environment that we live in, they're turning our worlds upside down. And social media makes attention to the First Amendment, truth, and ethical practices more important than ever. Social media is a part of nearly every discussion, every day, in every newsroom in this country. PR people like, like myself, we are regularly pitching reporters on Twitter. It forces you to be very brief, right? 
Reporters like brief pitches. Uh, furthermore, social media platforms, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and others, they're giving reporters new ways to build their own personal brands. In fact, if you're like the majority of people, you're increasingly following journalists, not necessarily the news organizations that employ them. People follow journalists who write about topics that they're interested in. Consider the Penn State crisis. I was glued to that um, news from the second that it broke last November. I was following Mark Vieira and Joe Becker, both superb uh, reporters for the New York Times. Um, I was getting things from them on Twitter and through Google Alerts. And at a distant second, I was following the New York Times, the news organization itself. These journalists' real-time updates were fascinating. I couldn't get enough of them. Okay, they kept coming to me on my iPhone with news updates morning, noon, and night. The way the story was reported and covered and shared, shared broadly through social platforms, initially from reporters, yes, but then through people, through coworkers, through friends, through friends of friends, so forth. The way it rolled out was pretty darn astonishing. And all the while, I felt like I personally sort of got to know Mark Vieira and Joe Becker, the reporters, just a little bit. There was a personal connection there that would not have happened five years or 10 years ago. So adopting and embracing social media platforms is how news organizations are remaining relevant. It's also how editors are identifying trends, and it's often how reporters secure their story ideas. A Pointer Institute survey that was uh, reported last June indicated that 62% of North American journalists say that they draw news from trusted sources on Twitter and Facebook. And 64% said that they regularly rely on blogs, well-known blogs, as a source of story ideas. But it's not just journalists who are being affected by this. Beyond journalists, marketers in corporations, organizations all over the country and well beyond are consumed with finding ways that social media will help them reach their audiences. And social media is mission critical to those of us in public relations. After all, our job is about helping organizations with their uh, corporate reputations and their storytelling, how we tell our clients stories. Through the news media, yes, but increasingly directly through other channels as well. So as you can see by these examples, the lines uh, between a credentialed journalist and engaged citizens and PR people for that matter are blurring more and more every single day. Um, credit, but I would add that credibility, reputation, relationships, they all still matter. And so do great writing, storytelling, and critical thinking. These have always been important, and they always will be. But social media is the game changer because it's disintermediating, which is another word, $4 word for cutting you out. They're disintermediating, um, in many cases, legacy journalism, traditional journalism. They are wiping them away. Our clients have learned that they have the means to reach and influence their customers and the broader public more directly without having to figure out how to get uh, some reporter to write a story. That's both exhilarating and also a little bit scary when you realize that how much is out there posing as fact when as much of it is completely unverified. So I've spent the majority of my career in public relations. I'm most aware of what social media is doing to my profession, how it's transforming public relations, my industry, and my work. But in order to talk about the trends in public relations, I think we need to first consider the trends in the news media, because the practice of public relations is affected so much by shifts that are occurring in the news media. Two of my colleagues, a guy named Chris Perry in our New York office and Matt Dickman in our Chicago office, recently wrote a piece that I thought uh, was a really nice summary of the key trends in the news media in the past few years. And so for those of you who are in journalism jobs now, I'd be eager to hear if, if you agree with these. But these are the five trends that they identified, which I think have huge implications for those of us in public relations. The first trend, uh, sadly, is that the standalone text-based article is dying. Let me say that one more time. The standalone text-based article is dying. 
look no further than the Pulitzer Prize winners in 2012. Two thirds of them, there was a major digital content component. Now media com companies deliver multi-platform, multi-format storytelling that ranges from rich infographics, which are a big thing, and videos, to apps to share information, data, and stories. Media today is social by design. Take the New York Times as an example. It's digitally minded with interactive elements, video, photo slideshows embedded across its wide range of topics. But beyond innovating formats, Facebook integration is another thing that they're doing very well. They allow readers to sign into nytimes.com via their accounts to see what their friends are reading and then sharing that, recommending and sharing more. So as you can see, journalism is very quickly moving to a very different place. It's very much more visual, really visual. Just two weeks ago, Gannett announced that it's creating a new news desk approach that's tapping, quote, the firepower of some 5,000 journalists um, at its 82 newspapers, 23 TV stations, and other news properties across the country. The editor sent in an email, and I saw it. He said that this new news desk will allow journalists to deliver news charts and visuals to every Gannett US media outlet. Notice the focus on charts and visuals. Visual is really important. This past summer, we had a high-profile murder trial in Minneapolis, and the Star Tribune, which is our major daily newspaper, covered the trial with a team of reporters. But none of us who read the Star Tribune had to wait till the next morning to understand what happened during the trial on a given day. Throughout the day and the evening, the Star Tribune was regularly posting photos of witnesses as they arrived at the courthouse or as they left the courthouse, family members who came and left and so forth. And then two or three times a day, I thought this was fascinating, two or three times a day, the, the main reporter for the Star Tribune walked outside of the courtroom, stood in front of a video camera, and basically offered, summarized the trial developments so far that day. It was like she was a TV news reporter. It was amazing. I mean, think about it. I found it to be fascinating anyway. Keep in mind that these were not highly produced videos, not at all. And she is not a TV news person, but that's what she was doing. In order to make the information current, relevant, personal, all of those things were extraordinarily important. Two or three times a day, we got to hear from Abby Simons. And she is not a TV person. She just came out and said it like it is. So the reality is, is they were immediate, they were conversational, and they also offered some personal um, kind of, I felt like I was personally in the courtroom, which I kind of wished I had been. So then after the court day ended, there would be a story that was posted on the website of the Star Tribune, and then it was shared broadly, and it went all over everywhere. And then, of course, the next day, they also had a story, yet another story, summarizing the days, day before events, but still kind of a new, a new angle. And this is what newspapers are having to do to remain relevant. It is a new day. An added benefit of these quick video updates from the Hennepin County Courthouse was that I literally felt I got to know Abby Simons, the reporter, a little bit. News organizations, yes, they're recognizing the benefit and the importance of visual assets, but they also want to have a much deeper, more personal connection with their audiences. And I think deep down, newspapers know that that standalone text-only story is dying. And as a result, they must share stories in many ways. Fast Company recently did a survey that indicated that 44% of people are more likely to engage with a brand if that brand posts photos. We like photos. It helps us figure out what information is important. It's kind of that default mode of sorting and understanding what's important. Twitter is considered the most infographic, hungry social network of them all. Infographics are retweeted 578 times compared with just 63 times for text-only tweets. Trend number two, editorial is now democratized. Media companies recognize the need to deliver a wealth of content in this nonstop news cycle. After all, content drives page views and that means ad revenue. As a result, many companies have opened up their ranks to guest 
expert authors contributed content because this increases breadth and depth of their coverage. As an example, Forbes about a year ago features expert contributors to broaden and deepen the coverage that it uh, offers, the content across a whole lot of topics. Contributors' points of view literally run side by side with journalists' written pieces. Forbes, in this case, benefits from networks of industry leaders and celebrity authors and has seen its page views rise exponentially and its coverage spread dramatically through social network distribution. I was talking last week with Rick Phillips, who's also on the Greenlee School of Journalism Advisory Council and a friend of mine. Rick heads up the corporate communications uh, for Nationwide Insurance in Columbus, Ohio. I was talking to him about this democratization of content and, and he agreed with me and he said though that what the, the important thing to remember there is that it makes the ethics training that you receive at Greenlee even that much more important. And he said, and I concur, quote, we need as many people as we can get who understand ethics and style and who are trained in good writing and clear messaging, unquote. He went on to remind me that people, that we don't always necessarily even recall where we read something or heard it or saw it. We get information from so many sources that content is often now considered almost equal in terms of credibility. So this makes the training that you receive to assure the accuracy of information more important than ever. I can tell you that we in public relations are big defenders, big fans of the training that you receive here at the Greenlee School of Journalism. Accuracy does matter. It always has mattered and it always will matter. The third trend is, is that news beats have become highly specialized. To address these, uh, the consumers' diverse and, uh, and specialized areas of interest, media are not only broadening their coverage, but they're also going deeper. So while traditional media has this finite amount of space, just the opposite is the case with online media. Sometimes we say it's the wild, wild west. It knows no boundaries. So take the Wall Street Journal as an example in this case. The journal has now morphed into a multi-sector news hub with a multimedia publication strategy that includes more than 40 blogs, breaking news updates via Twitter, and exclusively digital content. Reporters themselves are their own brands with large followings. They regularly use these social platforms to engage with readers and to source materials. The fourth trend is that the consumer's experience is highly personalized. So the front page is no longer necessarily the same for everyone, or even inside pages for that matter. Publications have infused their online properties with intelligence that delivers highly unique content to readers based on past behaviors. And consumers now expect this. They expect that each time they return, they'll be served up content that is already tailored to their specific needs. Take the Washington Post as an example in this case. Powered by a proprietary technology, uh, personalization technology called Trove, the Washington Post has now launched Personal Post, allowing readers to create this custom river of news that evolves, that evolves throughout the day based on their personal preferences and the individual's actions on the platform. And last year, the Post launched the Social Reader, an app for reading and sharing stories on Facebook. And it already has 15 million subscribers. Trend number five, and the final one, sourcing is more socialized. Recognizing that the importance of being relevant is so key, media companies now utilize social media monitoring to listen in on real-time conversations and to take advantage of up-to-minute trends and to provide content that matters to their readership. The Associated Press recently reorganized its entire newsroom around social. It has set a precedent for securing content from social media, encouraging reporters to research stories, source content, and to incorporate socially generated commentary and sentiment in the news. In addition, the Associated Press uses social media monitoring tools to track trends in online discussions to better understand how to deliver the most salient, relevant, and in-demand content. It's a new day. These trends in the news media are having a big impact on how public relations is practiced. Social media is part of everything we do. 
every project we do, every campaign we run. At Weber Shanwake, we look at our work through a prism, a proprietary uh, approach that we call content fusion. David Kreish, who's a colleague of mine in the Minneapolis office, is the master thinker behind this and the creator of content fusion. And it has literally swept Weber Shanwick like wildfire. PR Week named Content Fusion the winner of the PR Innovation of the Year Award in 2011. Think of it this way. As PR people, our job is to create content for our clients. Then we syndicate that content, and then we turn it in, that turns it into conversations, lots of conversations. And that is what our clients need and want. When you arrive this evening, I hope that you got a chance to get the program. And in there, there's an eight-page document on content fusion that goes into a lot of detail. I do hope that you'll take it home and read it with care, because I think it's the way we're going. It's content and how content is going to be fused and shared and moved and um, you name it in the future. But if you look at the back side of it, it'll just very quickly show you how it, it works. And that is, is that we create stories, so it still depends on the great storytelling in the middle. So it's that creation of storytelling. And then it's syndicating it through a lot of different channels. And then it's um, leading to conversations. Here's the deal. Our clients are basically becoming publishers, their own publishers. Another thing that's important to notice is that the arrows go both ways, both inward and out, to show that it's all about two-way communications. I recently read a quote in Ad Age um, that summarizes it pretty well. It said, quote, if there's one thing that we should have learned in this era of social media, it's that people are now being drawn to content not through traditional publishers and pages, but through people and feeds. The best content is not what surfaces most often through search results, but what travels most often between and among people. So if you think about it that way, I think it summarizes it pretty well." Unquote. Um, social media has been an important channel for a lot of campaigns that we do for a long, long time. The one that, that Zach mentioned that I worked on in the early years, um, the U.S. Treasury account to get Americans to direct deposit their Social Security checks, we've used social media in that campaign for a long time. I don't think it was there at the very beginning, but certainly in the last six or seven years. We were hired to do this campaign because it's very expensive to the federal government to have to send out checks every month to millions of people. But they also knew that the recipients of these checks were often underserved um, people who really couldn't afford not to get their check and also needed to have things be more safe and secure. So what was interesting about this is we developed this campaign much like a political campaign. So if you think about the presidential campaigns that are going on right now, both uh, Romney and President Obama have this national overlay with all the different communications things that are part of any national campaign. But then they also know that they need to zoom in and become local very quickly. Because at the end of the day, people make decisions based on things at the local level. Um, they also know that certain states are very important and others not so much. So we've patterned this entire campaign, the Go Direct campaign, after a political model. Not, a, not political, it's apolitical, but it's like a political campaign. So at the national level, we have national partnerships, we have websites in English and Spanish, we do earned media, we do social media, we do a lot of different things, a lot of different channels to reach people. But then we zoom in at the local level and we have trusted sources, trusted voices are the ones who are delivering the message at the most local level. That's how people vote. That's how people make decisions to change to direct deposit. And it's a campaign that's, that's worked uh, very, very well. Our research told us early on that we needed to deliver messaging from these trusted voices, not from the US Treasury. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's a big federal government agency, but people are not going to listen to what they're being told by a, a government agency necessarily. So our research told us that bank tellers are important and social security office, local social security office people, um, social service agents, um, agencies. We also learned uh, law enforcement, which is one thing we didn't expect, but people oftentimes have their checks stolen out of their mailbox and the first person they call is their law enforcement officers. So we also have worked with sheriffs, departments, and police and so forth all across the country. 
So one of the hallmarks of this campaign, though, has been about research, and that's what's so important to a successful public relations campaign, is to have it based on research and understanding your objectives and your audiences extraordinarily well, and then using every imaginable and smart channel possible to reach the check recipients. So I hope I've made a case for why social media digital work is so important. The digital world that we all live in is real time and it's the real thing. It's changing my work and your work. In fact, I'd say it's changing our world every single day. In PR, our clients want and need to have credibility with their stakeholders. To be credible, companies and organizations need to listen to what their customers are saying about them in all mediums. We constantly are doing monitoring, both traditional media and social media monitoring, to understand what's being said about our clients. That's extremely important, because you don't, if you don't know what's being said, you can't uh, address it. Our clients care a lot about reputations, and remember that most crises begin in social media today, and that then they either careen out of control faster than ever, or they could be neutralized by smart social media strategy, as we often do. Transparency is also extraordinarily important for our clients. And for organizations, being transparent with customers is now table stakes. Social media has made transparency unavoidable and that's a very good thing. Our clients want to be trusted, and trust can be lost in a matter of seconds, as you know. More than ever, organizations must be transparent with their stakeholders because they'll be called on the carpet if they aren't through social media. Ultimately, our clients care deeply about their brands, and they must. It's a well-known fact that people buy things, make decisions, take action, change their behavior, talk with friends and family if they trust a brand. So remember earlier in my talk when I talked about what it was like when I was here in journalism school from 1972 to 1976, investigative journalism was the name of the game. It doesn't mean that it isn't still incredibly important. But I would say that today, the name of the PR game is something closer to brand journalism. The addition of these social media platforms as major communications channels have led to many in my business calling what we do brand journalism. Some of have even gone so far as to say we should rename public relations brand journalism. To be perfectly honest with you, it's what we've done forever in, uh, in public relations for decades, although I would say we've done it more in a more sophisticated manner in the last half of my career than the first half. So if you ever wonder, will there be jobs for journalism graduates, think about the significantly greater need for writers and content creators, whether it's for an organization, corporation, government agency, social service agency, human resource agency, cities, states, you name it. People want content. They need content. And strong writers, there's a, there's a place for us. And then you add to that the constant need for 24-7 news, to produce news and content and analysis and context. Some people want to call it the 48-hour news day. It feels that way sometimes to all of us, doesn't it? Given all this, I'd say that the future is very bright for skilled, trained communicators. Companies are adding positions or reassigning existing staff to become content managers. There's a lot of new titles out there, content managers, community managers, website writers, social media community managers, bloggers. The days of PR people trying to convince the media to write or cover a story have changed so dramatically in just the past few years. Our companies, uh, the clients and the clients that we represent, companies and organizations, truly are become publish becoming publishers or the media themselves. I know that may be a scary idea to some of you, but that is really what's happening. A recent report by Blue Fountain News um, says that the best way to promote your brand is to create your own content and then syndicate it yourself. Many of our clients are creating their own content delivery system, and they need and want strong writers and people who think and work like journalists. My clients happen to be in the financial services industry. Zach mentioned some of them. Um, you know, financial services has obviously taken a big hit in the last five years, but they've also done some things that I think are pretty smart. And many of the brands are actually, some, in some ways, ahead of the game, ahead of the curve when it comes to brand journalism. 
Prominent examples include projects like American Express's Open Forum. There's also a thing called Business Without Borders that HSBC Bank um, has started. These are legitimate media outlets designed to promote their underlying brands without directly selling a thing. They're, they're, they're not marketing products, they're not selling anything, but they are a go-to resource. And by providing that relevant, valuable information to their target audiences via original content, guest writers, and media partnerships. So those things are really important, and that is what the name of the game is in the business. Tim Gray, who is a strategist for this Blue Fountain Media, says that his advice for PR people is fairly simple. He says, act like a journalist, writing with your audience's interests in mind, and interact with them whenever possible, lest they think that you're just another faceless marketing professional." Unquote. So provide true value to your readers and followers rather than directly promoting a specific product or service, and they will respond in turn. In other words, get them to trust your brand, and they'll be far more likely to buy whatever it is that you happen to be selling. The idea is not new, the venue is. It's all about engaging engaging always and in ways that people want to be engaged. As recently as four or five years ago, many people felt social media, it's not going to last. It, you know, it's gonna be a flash in the pan. It's not gonna take off. We had many organizations, some of our clients, who said not us. Being in the financial services industry, they are regulated by regulators in Washington and they said we can't do it because of FINRA rules or this or that or the other thing. But the reality is, is that now, I would say now that every corporation, every news organization, every nonprofit, every university, every government agency, every social service agency, city and state, every entity must care about social media and factor it into how it communicates and engages with its audiences. Social media is part of the mix of any successful um, integrated marketing campaign. It rarely replaces other forms of communicating. So there is some uh, encouraging word there. Those still remain, but the truth is, the key is, is that the interactivity that's now possible through social media makes it much more than a channel. It's becoming the infrastructure of communications, essentially where the streets intersect. A friend of mine says it's the new electronic public square. Building and protecting reputation is a large function of public relations, and this is just one of the reasons why the industry is growing and gaining increased recognition as a key part of, of uh, an organization's business success. Every company has a story to tell, many stories to tell, and PR enables them to be heard. Now more than ever, it's critical to define and to protect one's reputation. For individuals, for companies, for nonprofits, otherwise, being able to tell those stories and reach audiences is of the utmost importance. I believe it was Warren Buffett who once said that it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. So think of it this way, for-profit companies need a good reputation because stakeholders' opinions matter. They drive profit and they translate into sales. Reputation also impacts employee recruitment and retention. Or consider nonprofit companies such as hospitals. Their future depends on their financial performance and their reputation affects their financial performance. So nonprofits can't develop and deliver effective services if their customers, clients, and patients don't trust the organization. The livelihood of our government and our elected officials also depends on strong reputations, delivering on promises and results and working with the public to address issues and needs. Or consider uh, universities and colleges. Without a strong reputation, these institutions face declining enrollment and declining retention rates, reduced alumni and donor support, which all translates uh, into less tuition income and a smaller pool for successful alumni for donors uh, to tap for donations. So accurate, clear, transparent communication tactics have always been a part of safeguarding any organization's reputation. And using these new digital and social media tools will help organizations stay ahead of the pack these days. So your question might be, what does social media mean for the future of public relations? I'd say that there's never been a better time to be in public relations. I've been in it a long time, and I can tell you it is growing fast. The recent rapid rise of social media has heightened consumers' expectations for both information and direct interaction 
with companies. And an important part of building and, inter and maintaining reputation comes from content on these online um, platforms. Dr. Leslie Gaines Ross, who's a friend of mine, and she's our chief reputation strategist for our firm globally. She works out of our New York office. She said it well with this quote. She said, quote, a game change um, in branding and corporate reputation is well underway. In this fast-moving information age, consumers can now readily connect the dots between the brand they buy and the company behind the brand. Whereas it has long been known that a strong brand shines a light on a company's reputation, it is now clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that a strong company reputation adds an undeniable brilliance to the brand." Unquote. There are so many advances in the ways we communicate and gather and share information, and this is opening doors to new possibilities within the industry. Andy Polanski, who is my boss and the uh, president of our global firm, recently wrote a post titled Brightening the Outlook for Public Relations. He described it as a jump ball market, meaning that ad agencies and digital shops and PR firms are all competing with each other, as well as collaborating with each other at times, to see who's going to come out on top. Andy also pointed out that PR is becoming a much more prominent component of integrated marketing campaigns. Why? Because it's all about building relationships, and relationships matter. Forbes ranked PR number eight on the list, top 10 list of the hottest careers in the next 10 years. And that's driven by the need for companies, organizations to maintain their relevance and image in a high information age. Also, PR is becoming an $8 billion global market. That is a big market. The US Department of Labor has projected that public relations jobs will grow much faster, faster than normal job, gro uh, job growth rate of 23% between 2010 and 2020, and I think that's actually a very conservative figure. It's already grown a lot just since 2010. So if PR is what you want to do, how do you break into it? I know that this is one thing that I was asked to comment on, and I will just take a few minutes here at the end to, to wrap up with those. Uh, first of all, I hope I've made some of these points clear already, but great writing. Writing is extremely important, and knowing how to gather information, being resourceful, and writing is really at the center of the universe. Another thing that is extremely important, and I talked to some PRSSA students today and also one of Beth's classes about the importance of internships. I think you've all heard that message. I, I was re I'm really impressed with a lot of the internships that students here at Greenlee do, and I can tell you um, I, I, I talked to a lot of students from a lot of different schools, and Greenlee's internship program with 400 hours is, I, I don't know that there's another one like it. So, I mean, that's, that's a really impressive um, thing. So internships are important, and not necessarily one internship, two, three, four, whatever the case may be. Networking and follow-up are also very important. Networking is really important. Don't be, a, be afraid to ask for informational meetings. A lot of people know and remember what it was like to get started, and uh, a lot of people are surprisingly willing to meet with, with students. Um, another thing is having a good business sense. I think that this is one thing that surprises some of our interns that we hire, but you know, we are grouped in industry practices, so financial services, healthcare, technology, public affairs, consumer campaigns. So we're grouped that way. And so, you know, if I had a candidate that came through that had both financial services background or something related to financial services and journalism, that would be really appealing to me. So that specialization, I think, is increasingly going to be important and understanding the business world. We don't expect everybody to understand it all. We don't expect to find people who know financial services, but they have to have a, a willingness to learn and, and you know, be, be um, smart and savvy about it. Another thing is technical knowledge. We're increasingly adding videos and infographics, so videos, graphic design capabilities, photography. Um, we are hiring more and more young people with backgrounds not just in PR or journalism or English or whatever, but also people who know how to do some of these other what are seen as more technical things. Uh, the seventh point is a thirst for knowledge, eagerness to learn, and a willingness to take on new tasks. Um, that's probably much, pretty much true of any environment, any job, but um, that's a really important thing. And finally, being in industrious and being really ambitious. 
Um, you don't survive in a public relations firm if you're not industrious and if you're not ambitious. It's just, it's the way it is. And I think that that's probably true for a lot of other organizations as well. So if you think back on these eight things that I just mentioned, whether you're a PR, uh, hoping to be in PR or some other field, I think that these eight things are probably pretty important no matter what your career choice is. So in closing, I'm reminded of a book that some of you may have read as you were growing up, if you're young enough, um, but it's also great for adults. It's titled, Oh, the Places You'll Go. And it was by Dr. Seuss. How many of you have read this book? I love it. It's one of my favorites. Published in 1990, I think it was his last book before he died. If you haven't read it or if you've read it a long time ago, you should read it again because I think it touches on that spirit of adventure, the spirit of curiosity, and the spirit of learning. That's why I love it so much. It's that spirit of adventure and that spirit of curiosity and that spirit of learning that are all at the heart of what your years at Iowa State and Greenlee are all about. Life is about being curious. Life is about being open to the world and changes. Life is being open to those changes, and life is about learning new things. So grab your life, run with it, influence the world around you, and while you're doing this, I hope you have a lot of fun along the way. Thanks so much for your attention tonight. Okay, Michael says maybe questions. If you have some questions, you can. We have two microphones. You can you can go there, um, and then we have a reception after this out in the hall. So if you have some questions, just go up to the podium and ask away. <laughs> Curiosity. <laughs> Curiosity is important. I'm sure. All right. Yes. You know, I think all the social media tools, and Tumblr is certainly one of them. As I understand it, I don't know as much about Tumblr as I do a lot of the others. I, I understand it appeals more to a younger audience. And so in some of our campaigns, if we're trying to reach young audiences, we definitely uh, are using Tumblr. In the case of the financial services accounts that I'm familiar with and that we run, um, we're not using Tumblr. But it's because of the audience, I mean, again, it gets back to what are you trying to accomplish and who your audience is. And if your audience is 45-year-old people or 50-year-olds, you know, baby boomers planning for retirement, Tumblr is not, the, it's not the choice. But, you know, I don't mean to leave out Tumblr because I'm sure that in a lot of consumer campaigns, I don't work on consumer campaigns, uh, but we do, you know, we work for like companies like State Farm and General Mills and um, companies like that. And those are highly consumer campaigns and they're intended to reach a younger audience. So I'm sure that it might be part of that. Good question, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't mention Tumblr before. There are lots, right? Yes. That's awesome. Uh, first of all, Barbara, thank you so much for being here. Secondly, uh, just in regards to a lot of the things you've said about, um, you know, just media being convergent, increasingly relying on uh, digital media, visual messages, et cetera, um, there's a lot of concern that a lot of people had specifically in regards to, you know, First Amendment process and journalism. Um, how do we see, you know, media convergence employed responsibly? How can we allow, you know, if you look at things like the controversy regarding Newsweek's most recent mm -hmm. uh, cover about Muslim hype and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of overlooking the fact that it was actually very controversial within Libya itself, how can convergent media be employed responsibly? Well, I think, it, I think the answer is not known yet. I mean, you know, that, that's the worry that a lot of people have, and understandably so, because um, it, it's changing by the second. And how can you assure 
First Amendment in the environment. Um, I think you have to still expect that you have a lot of, of uh, trained journalists and people who understand the importance of the First Amendment. But we also have to do a lot more to educate people about what the First Amendment is. I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of people outside of journalism, I, I bet if you did a survey, it'd be shocking how many people don't know what First Amendment means and what it means to them as citizens of this country. So, I mean, that, he, that needs a whole education process of its own. And I know Iowa State's Greenlee School does the spring event, but there's you know, probably a lot more that, that could be done um, on a national level as well. Thank you. Thank you once again, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming.